So welcome, guys, to the class. Um, welcome to this, this lesson that we're doing. This is lesson number one of the foundation. We're talking about the foundation, and, and uh, we're kind of excited for this, excited to do this, this lesson. Um, it's so good to learn of God and learn of his word and to see what the Bible has for us and the life that God has appointed us to live, that he's called us to live. And so this lesson is on the foundation. It's what we would call the basics, I guess you could say. It's just getting back to that start. We're here in 100 Mile House. Uh, this time we're just a young church. We've been here for uh, going on three years that we've been here and, and, and growing and growing in God. And so it's a good thing that we start our foundation and we grow it in the right way and that we grow in the way that God has for us. So if you're watching this online, thanks for joining us. If you're here today <laughs> that's with us, thank you for being faithful. And uh, so, but for those that are watching online, that maybe you've just found this, you've signed up and joined in with this, um, we hope you enjoy it. Love to, glad to have you here with us. And I, I pray that, that the word of God would speak to you, not me, not my thoughts or my opinions, but that the word of God, that you would see a light of the glorious gospel that would shine into your heart. So let's just get right into this. Um, we're talking about the foundation. It's found in Hebrews chapter 6 and uh, verses 1 and 3. If you found this on YouTube, let me say as well, because this video is going to be hosted on YouTube. If you found this on YouTube, you can find in the description the links that you can click to go to Google Classrooms. You can log into the classroom, sign up for it, and follow along. We're going to have a quiz each week. So there's, there's notes that are, that are there in Google Classroom. There's a link there to be able to see the online notes um, that we are showing. You can't see it online, but we're showing the online notes on the screen here. Plus, we have a paper copy. But you can access the notes from online there in Google Classroom. You can find the videos, you can find the quizzes, and you'll be able to follow along and encourage you to fill out the quizzes and uh, get this word of God into your hearts. So Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 to 3 is where we're going to start with. Um, like I said, we're a young church and a new church, so we are really taking not a step backwards, but we are really going to kind of re reevaluate, I guess, or go back and say, okay, I want to make sure my foundation is right. If we're going to build a church here in 100 Mile House and do what we can for God, and God's going to build the church, but, but we're going to do all that we can for him, it's got to be built on a right foundation. It has to be started right and built right. And so this is what we're, we're wanting to do. So when we read the scripture here, we see where Paul says in verse 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ... Now, understand, too, this is the language in the King James, or the language that they would have used when he says leaving. You know, if you say, you know, I'm done with this job, I'm leaving this job, I'm quitting. In that idea, we have an idea of leaving something. It means you're gone, it's in the past, I'm leaving that behind, and I'm moving to something new. That's not what he means when Paul says this. When he says leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, he means coming off of them, building off of them, growing forward from them. And so it's not a discarding of, but it's a growing on top of or coming from, stepping off of, we'll say. So therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, Paul says, let us go on unto perfection. Now look what Paul says. He says, not laying again the foundation. So Paul's talking to these to the, the Hebrews when he writes this book the book of Hebrews, it's assumed that it's Paul. We really don't know. But the writer of Hebrews is saying to them, he's saying, don't lay that foundation again. So he's talking to people who are already bedrock solid. They've got this foundation. And he says, now he said, we're going to build and go off of that unto perfection or unto completeness. And so he's talking to them about growing in Christ. And so, But what we're going to do is we're going to go back, and we're not laying again, but we're going to lay for the first time, and we're going to lay this foundation. We're going to go back through the foundation that Paul is talking about here when he says this. So this is what this lesson is all about, this foundation. What does the Bible say is the foundation of the church? What's the foundation of why we do what we do? Why do we live the way that we live? How 
Do we live the way that we live? And so what are the things that are important for us to know this is part of the foundation? Well, here's the foundation that he says. He says, the repentance from dead works is the first one. And of faith toward God, that's the second one. The third one, of the doctrine of baptisms. The fourth one, and of laying on of hands. And the fifth one, and of resurrection of the dead. The sixth one, and of eternal judgment. So he says, these are the six principles. These are the six parts of the foundation, he said, that is that has already been laid. He said that we already have, and we're going to grow off of that, but we're going to go back and say, we're going to go back through this foundation. I want to make sure my foundation's right. I want to make sure before I continue to build on top of something, I want to make sure you guys, carpenters and people that have built, you have the plumb line and everything has to be straight and square. You ever move into an old house <laughs> and try, try to do some work on it and nothing in that house is square and level anymore and it's shifted and moved and, and you hang a picture on the wall and you're looking at the picture and you put a level on top and you're like, there, that's level. And you stand back and it just looks way off because the rest of the house is leaning sideways. But your picture, <laughs> your picture's level. So, but what we're doing with this is going back and saying, okay, I need to shore up these things. Let's make sure that our foundation is, is good and solid. And he says, and this we will do if God permit. So this is the lessons. These are the lessons that we're going to do. Our next lesson next week is going to be repentance from dead works then faith towards God, the doctrine of baptisms. That's going to be an interesting one. They're all very interesting, but that doctrine of baptisms is going to be a good one too. Of laying on of hands. That, this, that one there, I'll be honest with you, that one kind of, I, until I had read this, it was a few years back. I mean, I've read it many, many times, but it was only a few years back that I realized there's a doctrine of laying on of hands. There's, there's a, this is a, a foundation of laying on of hands. I thought it was just something that we just did when we're praying for people, but there's something, there's something more to this. And he says, this is part of the foundation of who we are, the foundation of who the church is. And then resurrection from the dead and then eternal judgment. He says, these are foundational things that you have to build on. So here for today, for the first lesson, this is what we're going to be dealing with today and talking about we're going to go kind of go back. This first lesson is, a, is we're going back to the cornerstone of the foundation. The foundation of the foundation, as it were. We're going to build this foundation. That The foundation of the church that we have is those things. Repentance from dead works and faith towards God and, and baptisms and all of those things. But he says, there. but there's a cornerstone. You ever see when they build those stone houses that they have they, what they call the cornerstone? That cornerstone has got to be perfect. It's got to be nice and square. It's got to be in its right place. It's got to be level. Everything about that, per that cornerstone has got to be just exact. And if anything is off on that cornerstone, when they begin to build, the rest of the building won't line up and won't fit together properly. So the cornerstone of the foundation is vitally important. So that's what we're going to talk about today in this lesson, lesson one is the cornerstone of the foundation is this. It's the doctrine of Christ. He says this. He says, wherefore, in verse number one, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Well, let's look at some scriptures and see what the word of God has to say about this cornerstone, about this foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11, and these are all right here in your notes. Pay special attention to the notes and follow along, and you'll be able to find for the, the quiz answers for the most part You'll be able to find all the answers in the notes for them. I may, I may try to have one question per quiz that requires you to step outside of the notes that you have to, to find something a little bit, a little bit more a challenging question, right? <laughs> and so, but for the most part, it's all going to be here in your notes. And so, and this is what we're doing. We're we're working from the Word of God, from the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He said there's no other foundation. It's Jesus. There's nothing else. He's talking about that cornerstone. He says there is nothing else that, that man, mankind has tried for centuries to try to build a life that would last forever. They've tried to build empires that would last forever, and none of them do. 
There will come a time when Canada will no longer even be hardly a memory on the face of this earth. There will come a time when the United States will not be a kingdom, that it will not be a country. And it seems like we're getting closer and closer to that time all the time with all the unrest and the things that we see. But he says, but there is a foundation. It's Jesus Christ. He's that foundation that no man can lay. There's nothing besides him that is going to be a foundation that's going to last. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. He says, Now then ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The apostles of the New Testament, the prophets of the Old Testament. He said, you're built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. That's why we talk about this apostolic doctrine. That's why we say we are an apostolic church because it's a New Testament church. It's built upon that foundation that comes from the prophets that has the apostles are sitting upon the prophets. And that's our foundation that our church is built upon. And Jesus Christ, look at what he says here. He says, and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. It's all built on Jesus. It's Jesus, and then everything sits on top of him. And so we are in that apostolic age. We are in that apostolic time where it's the outpouring of the Holy Ghost and baptism in Jesus' name and all the things that we're going to get to here at the rest of our foundation class that we're having. So he says this, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So then we have to stop and ask ourselves this question then. Does anybody know what Jesus' last name is? Can you tell me Jesus' last name? I think if you ask that question to so many people in the world, you say, what's Jesus' last name? What do you think their answer would be? Carpenter. <laughs> mm. There you go. It's a good occupation, but his last name, if you ask them, what's Jesus' last name? Probably the vast majority of people would say Christ. Christ well, Christ is his last name. It's Jesus Christ. I'm Chad LeKing. You're Ricky Lee, you know. It's like, this is, the, this is my last name. This is what I go by. This is what I sign my checks with. This is the, if we ever sign checks anymore. But, and he says this. And so, but do you want, when he asked this, or, or he'd ask somebody that question, they would, they would say it innocently, and yet without knowledge, knowing, not knowing or realizing that Christ is not a name. Christ is a title. Christ is a position. Christ is a New Testament, so the term Christ is, is from, that, from the Greek, and, and it's that term um, that is it's a title that's given for, in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, it was, we would say, the Messiah. The Old Testament would say, Hamashiach, it's the Messiah. And so it means the Savior, if you will. The, it's, it's referring to the mediator, and so it's that position, because they were fully expecting the Jews, when, when it asked this question about Christ, the Jews were absolutely expecting there to come a man that was going to lead them into victory. They're, they've been overrun by the Romans. They're ruled by the Romans. And they're trying to walk the line between trying to live in, in the way that they knew how to live for God and to do everything right and yet fulfill all the requirements from Rome and, 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 and it's unrest and it's just, as a matter of fact, there's many historians, even historians from long ago, that attribute the fall of Rome to Jerusalem and to Israel because they were unable to contain that one little country because they refused, Israel just absolutely refused that Roman rule and fought against it and caused them so much hassle and so much distraction that it allowed other nations around to attack Rome and Rome was split and, 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 it, and it just couldn't hold up. So, but this, is, this was their mindset. And so because they're looking for this man that was going to step on the scene and was going to be the leader for them and was going to lead them into glory. And this was the, this was the Jews would have said the Hamashiach. This is the Messiah. This is the, the one that was going to come and lead them. And they were fully expecting to have an earthly kingdom. They thought for sure that, yep, we're going to rule everything because the prophets had told us this in the Old Testament, and, and, and we're going to, it's just the whole world's going to basically bow to us, basically. And we're going to be the top guys. So when Jesus shows up 
And Jesus begins to do the things that is prophesied of the Messiah doing. So when you hear that term Christ, you understand this. And one of the first things for you to make sure you remember this. Get this in your mind. When you hear the term Christ, it's not his last name. It means Messiah. It means the Messiah. Jesus, the Messiah. And so this is who they're looking for, the Messiah. So when, when they begin to, when Jesus starts to do all of the things that is prophesied about the Messiah doing, and the Jews are looking at him going, wait a second, you don't fit our image of what we thought the Messiah was going to be. They're looking at him and they're saying, you're just some lowly carpenter, some son of a carpenter. You're just this itinerant preacher, they would call him, just this guy walking around. And, and you're doing incredible things. And some of the things that you've done absolutely fits the bill of what the prophet said was going to happen. But there's no way you could be the Messiah. There's no way that you could be the Christ. And so they're asking him this question. And so we get to this in Mark chapter 14 as they're... As they're um, got Jesus on trial. They have him on trial to crucify him, and they, they're trying to incriminate him, and nobody, nobody can incriminate him, and, and they keep getting these witnesses come in and say things, but they can't prove anything. And so the Sanhedrin, who is all of these top council Jews that are there, and they're all the religious powerful ones, and they're convened, they're together, and, and they're trying to get Jesus to say the wrong thing. And so in verse 60 of Mark 14, it says, The high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee, which these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Look, art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? See, they're trying to get him to say it. They want him to say it because if they can get him to say it, now they say he's incriminated himself because they don't believe that he is. And so the, the mankind, mankind from the beginning, right back to when Jesus came to the earth, all of the religious people, all of those guys that are there that had studied and knew and they had their idea of what God was, and in their mindset, they knew what the Messiah was going to be. And they had it all figured out in their own mind. And they're looking at him, and, but they don't recognize him. And they ask Jesus, art thou the Christ? Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. I am. He identified himself that he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And ye shall see the Son of Man, I love this verse, sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. That was that Hebrew way that he was saying to them, you're going to see the glory of God revealed in me. You're going to see me at that position of power and authority. You're going to see me coming in the clouds of heaven, which was prophesied of the Ancient of Days. It was prophesied of the Old Testament and speaking of him coming in the clouds. And so he says, you're going to see this. He identifies who he was. So it's quite interesting that, that here's these, these, these high priests and the guys that have studied and have learned, and they don't know who Christ is. They don't recognize who he is. And so, but the devils, look at now the devils in Luke chapter 4 and verse 41. The devils knew who he was. It says, and the devils came also out of many crying and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them suffered them not to speak, for they knew he was Christ. They had no doubt then they knew for a fact that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Christ. It's interesting to consider that because while the devils knew who he was, they didn't know what he was there for. Because if they had known what he came for, if they had known what he was about to do, they would have never crucified him. But they knew full well who he was. They understood that he was Christ. So then we have to stop and kind of ask ourselves this question. We're talking about the foundation, right? We're talking about the cornerstone. The cornerstone is Jesus Christ. It doesn't just say Jesus. It doesn't just say the Messiah. 
It says Jesus Christ. He is the chief cornerstone. Jesus Christ. So then we have to stop and ask ourselves then. Well, okay, then if man, if those religious guys couldn't identify Jesus or the Christ, and they're asking him, are you the Christ? But the devils knew full well who, who he was and knew that he was Christ. Then we stop and ask this question of ourselves. Well, then what is the title of Christ? What does this, what's so significant about this? What, it, what was it that the priests were asking and the devils were confirming? What is it about Christ? Jesus even said that in one other spot. We don't have it in the verses here, but it just kind of popped into my head. Jesus even said that in one place when they're asking him, and he, and he, he says, I'm going to ask you a question. He says, he says, you know, what is it of Christ? Whose son is he? And they said, well, he's David's son. And he said, if he's David's son, how is it that David said, the Lord, Jehovah, said unto my Lord, the Christ, sit here at my right hand until I make thy enemies my footstool. And that so baffled those Jews and those high priests and those, those guys that studied because he's looked, Jesus just looked at them and he, he basically gave them one of the greatest revelations of the oneness of God and they couldn't grasp it because he says, how is it then if Jesus or if Christ is the son of David, how is it that David says that Christ in his, his Lord? How is it that he's above him? How is it that Jehovah, the one true God, can look and say, he's your Lord. You sit here until, on, on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And when he says this to them, they're baffled. They're confused because, see, they can't see the revelation that I hope you can see. And they can't see the revelation that we would be able to get from the word of God and from the spirit of God that he is in Christ. We're going to get to this in a second. That in Christ is both God and man. That David can say, he's Jehovah above me. But my son, my descendant, the man Christ Jesus is also above me just the exact same way and being able to see the revelation of just who Christ truly is so first John chapter 2 oh, and so wait a minute. yep fire right no it's okay I, I just don't understand this language in Luke 441 yep can you like in Luke 441 yeah yeah can you speak that in like a layman yeah so it says so if you're reading the context, the verses before, Jesus is healing people and casting out devils. He's doing miracles. Yeah. So it says, and the devils came out of many, crying out. So he's casting out these devils out of people. Okay, who is? The Jesus is. Jesus yep. is casting out the devils. Yep. Crying and out. as the devils are coming out, because Jesus is basically saying to them, you, come out. You've got no place in them. And when he says this, as they're coming out, they know who Jesus is. And it says oh. that the devils are speaking out and crying out, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Okay. And he rebukes the devils because it's not, it's not his time for everybody to know who he is. And it's not the moment for everyone to know yet. And so he's still, he's still uh, he, if they knew who he was, if everybody knew who he was but beyond a shadow of a doubt, he'd have had he'd have had millions of people following him and multitudes and he would never have been able to get to the cross. Okay. So he's saying to the devils, no, you stop. You can't tell them. They can't know this because he knows the purpose that he's come for. So he wouldn't allow them to speak for they knew he was Christ. So like for us normal people, if you're reading that, you can't make sense out of that. Well, you can, you, you can for, for the sake of, of brevity, we'll say, or efficiency, I've only put that one verse in because it's just talking about the point of the devil saying, thou art the Christ. But if you're reading the context, if you go back and read Luke chapter 4 and you read the whole story through, then that verse just falls right in and you understand that he's talking to the devils that have been cast out of people. But just out of that one verse, yes, I can see how you get, you're not, you know, it gets confusing as to who's talking to yeah. who and what, what, right? right. Yeah, you got to read, read around it. Anytime you read something and you're like, what does that mean? You know what I do? People will say, go back and read the verse before and verse after. No, I go back and read the chapter before mm -hmm. and that chapter and then that verse and then the chapter afterwards to get a context of what's, of what's happening and what's going on and what's being said so that you can understand. That's the danger. That's the danger of cherry picking. Um, that's how we get so many false doctrines and teaching in the world is people will take one little thing 
and they'll say, see, here's this, so this means this, and then they'll try to pull that out without having the voice of what the Bible says, two or three witnesses, like two or three things that are saying the same thing, showing the same thing. This is how it works. This is, this is what we have. So, um, yeah, good question, though. Very good question. So here we are then. So we're talking about the title of Christ. So we're talking about this. What is, the men don't understand who he is. The devils know, but he tells them, you be quiet. So then the whole question comes down to this. What is, what is the doctrine of Christ that he, we started with in Hebrews? If this is the chief cornerstone, who Jesus is, that Jesus, the Christ, Jesus, Hamashiach, the Messiah, if this is the cornerstone, then I need to know this. We need to know this. If, if our foundation that we're building upon, sadly, it seems like there's so many people in Christianity today that come to God and they're, they're honest people and they're, they're sincere and they are legitimately looking for God, and they want something more of their life, but somebody tells them, oh no, all you have to do is confess Jesus, and then you're good to go and just you know, come and sit and listen to something every, every Sunday if you want to, or you don't have to come, you're saved, once you're saved, you're always saved, and, you're, and, and, and they kinda, it becomes a social club. Hey, come and we're gonna, we're gonna go out hunting this weekend, and come join the hunting club, and come join the, and it's not, like it's great to have, we're a family, we're a community, we need to have things together that we do. But it becomes nothing more than a social club. It's their, it's their life. And so, and it's sad to see because there's people that are genuine, but they come and if you said to them, like, can you tell me about God? They couldn't tell you. If you say to them, hey, what about the doctrine of, of baptisms? They would be, uh, no, you don't need to be baptized. That would be the answer for so many people in the world. Well, well what about laying on of hands? Have you, have you what, what? And they, they would be so blank on so many of these things. And yet, Paul says, these things are the foundation that we build off of them. This isn't the place we dwell. He says, this isn't, we don't ju just keep rehashing this. we got to build this. And when the foundation's built, now we go on to perfection. We continue to grow. But they wouldn't even know those things. Nevertheless, going back to the position of, well, who is Christ? Because this is the chief cornerstone. The revelation of who Jesus is, is the chief cornerstone that everything else in, in true Christianity, what I, we would say the apostolic church, everything else is built upon that. And if that's not right, everything else is not going to stay level and it's not going to be plumb. It's not going to grow and build the way it's supposed to. And so thankfully, though, when somebody has a hungry heart, God will lead them into all truth and he'll bring us to righteousness. So we're asking this question then, what is the doctrine of Christ? We're trying to get this, this answer, what the biblical answer is. What is Christ then? If, if who Jesus Christ is is so important, if he's the chief cornerstone, I need to have this. Is he, is he a second divine person, an eternal, co-equal, co-eternal, existent person that's always been? Is this who he is? Is this who the Bible says that he is? Or is he an angel that God sent down from heaven and he's Michael the archangel that came down, and, but he's not God? Or is he just a man that attained unto some high and lofty thing and kind of made himself to kind of sort of be kind of a God? Or, or just who is Christ? What is the doctrine? What does the Bible say that the doctrine of Christ is? This is so important. Like I said, everything else is built on this. Everything. If I don't have this right, if I don't understand who Jesus is, that's why, I don't think we have it in our notes here, but that's why when Jesus asks the question, and it's, you've probably heard me mention it before and you've heard it often preached and quoted when he's talking to Peter, and he asks Peter, who do men say that I am? And Peter says, well, some say that you're the prophet, some say that you're Elijah, some say that you're this one and that one. And so he said they had all these answers of who they thought that he was. And Jesus says to Peter, who do you say that I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed art thou, Simon. He said, for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my father, which is in heaven. You can only get this, this revelation that comes from God when you see who Jesus is. When you see the revelation of Christ and you understand the uniqueness of Jesus and the position of Jesus 
and who he is to us. Is he just a good man? Is he just some guy that lived 2,000 years ago that changed the world? Is he just some crazy misunderstood guy that they ended up crucifying? Is he just, is, is, he, is he just God? Was he just simply, was Jesus just simply, uh, uh, they, they, some people will use the term, and I, and I hate it, I despise it, but that term like meat suit, was he just a puppet? That he was God, but there's nothing else about him, and he just did what God told him to do, like a robot, basically, and he's just this, and he's all God and no man, or is he all man and no God, or is he what, just exactly what does the Bible say that Christ is? What is the doctrine of Christ? First John chapter 2, verse 21, we get into this. Um, he says, John says, I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth. That's an interesting phrase. That's good to, to realize that. He said, I'm not talking to people that don't know this already. He said, I'm talking to those that already have this revelation. He said, you know the truth. But because ye know it, he said, I'm writing to you because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he that, beneath, but that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He said, if you deny that Jesus is the Christ... Again, then we ask that question, of, well, what is the Christ? Why does this matter? We're going to get to it. He says, he is antichrist. Look at this phrase. That denieth the Father and the Son. If you deny Christ, he said, if you don't, if you don't understand that Jesus is the Christ, you're denying the Father and you're denying the Son. But whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. That's interesting. He said, if you've, if you've acknowledged the Son, Jesus Christ, if you see the humanity, if you see the man, the Son, that man, the, the, the Christ that can die on a cross, that can bleed, if you see the man that can get hungry, the man that has to grow, the Bible says, in wisdom and stature, the man that was a little boy, if you see the humanity, he said, when you see Jesus... He said, you have seen this. He said, you acknowledge that you have the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. This is one of those things, too. When you, if you, that's one of those verses. You ever talk to somebody and they, when they talk about the Trinity, and they will say, well, the Trinity, the Trinity, the Trinity. And you say, when did the Trinity come in? Who was the first guy that said it? Well, it was Tertullian that first said, you know, three persons and one essence and one, you know, trace persona and all of that. And he said that somewhere in the mid you know, 100 to, or, or close to 200 and, and A.D., so 200 years after Jesus, he says it. And then you have all these councils, and they hash it out, and they're trying to figure out who is God and who Jesus is, and is he God the Father, God the Son, are they co-eternal? And, and it takes them hundreds of years, and at the beginning, the, Trini the Holy Ghost isn't even considered as a person, and then it's brought in where, no, he must be a person. And so it takes all of this time for them to develop what they call the, that, that teaching of the doctrine of the Trinity. And so it's hundreds of years later for man and their wisdom and their counsels to kind of devise this philosophy, and it really comes from Greek and Roman philosophies, and, and to create this doctrine. And yet here John says to them, he says, let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. John was one of the disciples that walked with Jesus. He's the last living one. He lived to roughly 90 years of age or so. And he's talking to them and he's saying, you, this, is, this is what you've heard all the way back from the beginning, this doctrine of Christ. He that abideth in this. You, if you have the Son, you have the Father. Notice he's not saying anything about a trinity. He's not talking about three persons. He's not talking about any of that doctrine that is so prevalent in the world today. But yet he's talking, he's saying, he says, if you've got the doctrine of Christ, this is the one that came from the beginning. It didn't, it didn't happen until, the Trinity didn't happen for hundreds of years later until it's finally kind of hammered out to be what it is. And even today, I think, there, I think scholars say there's like 19 variations of the Trinity and, 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 they, and, and even amongst Trinitarians, you can have people debating and believing this and not believing that because the whole doctrine is so, it's, it's so, I want to say convoluted, but it just, it's, it's, 
It's so scattered. It's so full of holes. And in order for this hole, you bring something up and, they have to, and, and it has to keep changing positions. And, and, and then all of a sudden they have to create more doctrines and more beliefs in order to make the, the, to smooth over the holes, as it were. I work for Dawson doing road maintenance and stuff. And it's like some of these back roads, you got to just, it's pothole on top of pothole and patches here and patches there. And that's basically what it is with the doctrine of the Trinity is it's just been patchworked and patchworked and patchworked because somebody else would bring up something and say, wait, but the Bible says this. Oh my, yeah, that's right. Well, we got to change this then. We got to change this then. But yet John says, this is what you've had from the beginning. And he says, and if that which ye have, have, have heard, verse number 24, if that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, he said, if you hold on to what you had from the beginning, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. He said, you're going to continue in the Father and in the Son. Now, if the mindset, if you have the mindset before that says there's already three, you have to ask yourself the question, why is the third one not mentioned here? And why is the Holy Ghost not mentioned as anybody important? You don't have to continue in him. You just continue in the Father and Son. So you ask yourself that question. But you also stop and say, okay, if, it's, if he's saying the Father and the Son, is he talking about two eternal people in God? Or is he talking about God, the Father, and the man, the humanity, the Son? You, you, you consider, consider those, those questions and to, and to see, because we're trying to get to this, right? We're trying to get to the doctrine of Christ. Who is, who is the, what is the doctrine of Christ? What does it teach? Well, we see this right here when he said this already. He said, okay, here's a simplistic idea of it. Here's the first line of it, we'll say. Here's the doctrine of Christ. If you're in him, you, if you're in Christ, you have both the Father and the Son. So both the Father and the Son are in Christ. So that's, you're, you're looking at that saying, okay, so this is narrowing it down. This is helping me to see a little bit more than to say, okay, here's the doctrine of Christ. In Christ, I have the Father, and in Christ, I have the Son. Okay, this is good. I got this. Let's move on. Second John chapter 1, he says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. He said there's a lot of people... There's a lot of uh, teachings and stuff that say that Jesus didn't actually, it was divine flesh. He wasn't really a, a real man, and he didn't actually come. And some that say he just didn't come at all. And the ones that say, well, he came, but he wasn't really the Christ. And he, there's all kinds of ideas that people have. But he says those are deceivers. If they say Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh, this is a deceiver and antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which, he, which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth, he says, this is a transgression, he says, a sin, a doing wrong. He said, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ. There's that term, doctrine of Christ. He said, if you don't abide in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. If you're not in Christ, you don't have God. The Jews de denied God. Christ that denied Jesus and said, no, 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 we're going to stick to the Jehovah that we had before. They don't, they no longer have God. Once Christ came and he revealed who God was and he revealed God to mankind, if they stick to the old thing now, this is why John, this is why Paul teaches this about the law and says, I'm telling you, the law is not going to cut it for you anymore. He calls it the weak and beggarly elements of the world. He says, that law is not going to work anymore. Why? Because if you don't abide in Christ, you don't even have God. You can't have part of God. You can't have this form of God and say, see, I've got him. If you deny Jesus, if you deny Jesus is the Christ, he's the Messiah, you've got nothing, nothing. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, this is such an important phrase right here, important scripture. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. He says, if you stay in this doctrine, you'll understand, he said, that in Christ is both the Father and the Son. If you're in Christ, if you're in Hamashiach, if you're in the Messiah, if you're in the mediator, as it were, 
if you stick to this revelation right now, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not given it to you. But he says, if you'll get this revelation that in Jesus Christ, you have got both the Father and the Son. You have got God Almighty, and you have got the man, the flesh, the humanity that is together, and he's the Messiah, and he's the revealing of who God is. He says to this even in verse 10, if there come unto you any, and they don't bring this doctrine. This is how important this is. This is the chief cornerstone of the church and of everything else that's built on this. If they come and don't bring you this doctrine, he said, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. So the doctrine of Christ, you can see in scripture here that the doctor of Christ is that with Jesus, in Jesus Christ, we have both the Father and the Son. And then there will be, there will be those that will read those scriptures and will say, well, no, 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 because it means God the Father and God the Son, those two co-eternal, co-existent persons. And they'll say, see, that's, if you've got the Son, then you have the Father, and, 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 but they're, they're both God and they're both co-eternal. And so then, then you would ask this then. So then, of course, there must be a scripture then. There must be a Bible verse that would tell us and would say that God is. To us, there is but one God because there's many will say, well, I believe in one God. Say, well, then where is the scripture that says to us there is but one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Not a single one. There's, no, there's not a single verse that says this. There's not a single verse that declares this. But so if we stop and say, okay, then well, who is God? Who is the Father? 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6, here's what he says. Paul says, but to us, there is but one God, the Father. He says, there's only one God, the Father. Now, you can read that verse and say, oh, see, Jesus isn't God. He, it's the Father. The God, there's only one God, and that's the Father. That's it. See, so you're not in the doctrine of Christ. Because he says this when he says to us, there's only one God, the Father. That's it. That's it. There's no, there's no three persons, co-eternal. There's no division of God. There's only one God. He's the Father. He says, of whom are all things. And we are in him. And one Lord, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, by whom are all things. And we by him. So see, in the telling the truth that Paul is speaking here in this, when he's declaring this and saying there's only one God, it's the Father, someone could take that verse and say then, well, then Jesus isn't God. You can take, this. what we were saying before about misconstruing, right? About reading one verse and kind of going, uh, yep, this is what it means then, or getting confused by it. So you can read that one verse and say, well, see, there's only one God. But you can't read that one verse and say there's one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's because you're never going to find that verse anywhere in the Bible. But it says there's only one God. Well, then how do we understand this verse then? If there's one God, but there's one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. Well, look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. He says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man. Christ Jesus. So he's declaring this. He's saying, look, there's only one God. Who's the one God? What did we just read in, in 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 8? For there's one God, the Father. And this is what he's speaking here, Tim Paul, is when he's speaking to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2 and 5. He's saying there's only one God. That's the Father. We already established that in 1 Corinthians. There's one God, and there's one mediator. There's that Messiah. That's the Christ between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. That he stands there, as it were, in that position be as a mediator between God the Father and between mankind. And he represents mankind to God and says, here's the blood for their sins. Here's the price paid for their sins. Here's their redemption. Here's the remission of their sins. Here's the price that paid to cover all the things that they did. They're in me now. They're in me. They're, I, they're my body. It's the body of Christ. This is my bride. And so he stands there as the human, as the, the man Christ Jesus saying this. But then he also stands there as the mediator turning around to mankind 
as the Christ. He stands there at that intersection point, if you will, and points and turns back and represents God to man. He is God to man, reflected in the light of God that shines out through Jesus Christ. We're going to see that in some verses in a second here. So because you look at it from one direction, you can make a statement and say, Jesus is a man. But you can also turn around with another scripture and looking at it from the other understanding and saying, but Jesus is God. And there's only one God, the Father. He's the revelation of God to mankind. John chapter 14, verses 6 and 10. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. See, there's that intersection point. There's that bridge, if it were. You can't get to the Father except you're coming through me, Jesus says. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He says, you can't get there but by me. Verse 7, he says this, if you had known me, you'd have known my Father also. Watch what he says now. And from henceforth ye know him, and you've seen him. Well, the Bible says no man has seen God. But Jesus said, no, 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 you know him. If you knew me, you knew him. Not in the sense that if I know, I've heard that argument, I've heard people say that, and I, I know i got to get going, we only got 10 minutes here, but I've heard people say that. I talked to some Jehovah Witness folks, and we were talking about that one time, and, and they said, well, this is like your son. And, you know, it's, he's the son, and if you meet the son, you've, you've pretty much seen the father. They, they look exactly alike, and they're pretty much just identical. And I said, really? And I called Sam over, and I said, Sam, and I was like, this is my son. And Sam's got blue eyes and blonde hair, and he's skinny <laughs> and full of energy and life. And I'm standing there with black hair and dark eyes, brown, whatever color eyes, and, and, and tired and worn out <laughs> and old. And I said, he doesn't look anything like me. He's my son, and he doesn't look anything like me. You can't take some weak explanation to try to justify something or explain something when the scripture itself explains it to us. When Jesus says, if you, if you, when you see, he says, from henceforth, you've seen him and you know him, you know him, you know the father. Why? Because there's only one God, the father. Jesus saith unto him, or Philip says back to him in verse eight, then Lord, show us the father. See, he misses it. He's missing it. Here's the Christ. This is the doctrine of Christ. This is the revelation of God to mankind. And he's missing it. He says, let us see the Father, Jesus, and it'll suffice us. And Jesus says to him, have I been so long time with you, Philip, and yet you haven't known me? Look what he says. He that hath seen me hath seen not not just, you haven't just seen, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like my dad. I look like him. It, it's good enough. If you see me, it's good enough. No, no, no. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is the doctrine of Christ. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If you've seen the man, Christ Jesus, if you've seen who I am, Jesus is saying, then you've seen the one Father, the one God that dwells inside of me. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? And the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, Jesus says, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. The divinity that was in Jesus Christ was not the divinity of some second person. It was not the divinity of God the Son. It was divinity of God the Father. It was the Father that was inside of Jesus Christ, reflecting and representing and showing himself to the world through Jesus Christ, through the man Christ Jesus, because you can't see God without him. And this is what I'm saying to you. This is why I hope you're getting this. This is the foundation that the church is built upon, who Jesus Christ is. Everything else. Everything else will crumble and fall if it's not built upon this. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. It's so important to get this. This is scripture. I'm not, I'm not building my own doctrine here. I'm showing you something from the word of God. And everything else fits into this. And, and, and hopefully as we continue these lessons later on, the next 
I'd, I would love to do another online lesson series on the oneness of God and to have a bit more of a classroom setting and be able to answer questions because there's a lot of questions that people have. Well, what about Jesus' baptism? What about let us make man in our image? What about all of these different questions that people will have that they don't, that they, they don't grasp or they don't see? But when you see the doctrine of Christ, it all makes perfect sense. It all fits in when you see the humanity of Jesus and God the Father, the divinity 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. You can't see God. See, it's, I think that's where so many people get their, they, they, they struggle or they kind of, they wrestle with that because they think, well, that God is somehow can, can be contained. They think that it's like, okay, well, here's God in this bottle, and if, if we could just see this, then we would see the Father, and here's the Father, and that Jesus is an image, so he's just, he's like a picture of this. If you, you know, you take a picture of the bottle, and then you can show people, well, here's the picture. This is the picture of the bottle, and you're not really seeing the bottle. You're not seeing the Father, but it's the picture of it, and so they have this image because they think that God could be contained and that God could be revealed inside of his creation. But God is, the Bible says God is a spirit. And he's, he is, it's impossible for us inside of creation to see God in his entirety. You can't see his left hand and his right hand. I had a discussion with somebody not too long ago. And they were talking about that. Well, Jesus sitting at the right hand when Stephen Stone and he's sitting at the right hand of the father. And like, how do you explain that? It's like, well, how, how tell me where the right hand of God is. You can't get to it. How far do you have to go to get to the right hand of the Father? There is, there is no literal right hand of the Father. You can't come to the edge and say, oh, there it is right there. There's the drop. There's the stop. Here's the right hand of God. That's where God ends. That's where his right hand is. You, you can't get to that. It's impossible for us to get to that. So we can't see God. He's a spirit. You can't know God in that entirety of God the Father without Jesus Christ. He is the revelation of God. He's the only God revealed to mankind. He is the mighty God in Christ. And so he is the image of God. He's the revealing. He's that, that, that showing forth of God. It's God the Father that's in Jesus Christ. And that's who we see. That, 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 that Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, look at this, but Christ Jesus, man, it's something you got to watch this when you read your Bible, how often it says Christ. There's times in there where it just says Jesus. But when it says Christ, it's there for a reason, because it's talking about this doctrine. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the father and the son. And he says this, he says that. Um, for we preach on ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He's the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. We've already established, Paul said to us, there is but one God, the Father. And he said he is the light of the knowledge, the knowing of the glory of God in the face of of Jesus Christ. This is the doctrine. This is the doctrine. This is the foundation that all of these other things we're going to get to, all of our other lessons that we're going to get to, they're all built on this. You can't build it on anything else. No other foundation, Paul says, is any man laid. This is it. So the doctrine of Christ declares that the one God, the Father, was in the man Christ Jesus. The Jehovah Witness talked to them. They have to change their Bible and alter verses because they can't have these verses in here because they say God is one, one of their doctrines is that God is not, Jesus is not God. He's, they believe he's an angel, but they say that he's not God and, and that you kind of see him as a reflection of God, I guess, or just a, a picture, I guess. But he says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19 says, so these are the verses that they have to change. He says, to wit that God, how many gods are there? One. Who did Paul establish already? Who do we know already? There's only one God to us. There is but one God, the Father. And he says this to wit in the same book, Corinthians 
that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. In the doctrine of Christ, you have both the Father and the Son, that he was in the man, Christ Jesus, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Here's our last verse for our class. He says in 1 Timothy 3 and 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. You would expect that if you listen to the teaching and the doctrines of the mainline church for the last 1,500 years or whatever it might be, you would expect that this verse would say, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was revealed in three persons. That God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost are one God. You would expect that to be there. But that's not what it says. When it says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God, my, was manifest in the flesh. That's the mystery. That's the, that's the doctrine of Christ. That God the Father and the flesh, the man Christ Jesus, that's Christ right there. That God was manifested in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. He was seen of angels. He was preached unto the Gentiles. He was believed on in the world. He was received up into glory. The man Christ Jesus revealing God to us. God manifested in flesh. And this is the cornerstone of the foundation that the church is built upon. This is the cornerstone. Without this cornerstone, like I've said already, every doctrine, everything's going to crumble. Everything will falter. Everything will fail without this one. We don't, I don't have the verses in here, but you can go back and read them later on if you want. But when it says this in Matthew chapter 7, and verse 24, it says that. Remember the story? Remember that song? I remember that in Sunday school. The wise man yeah. builds his house upon the rock. The wise man builds his house, you know, and the rains came down and the floods came up, rains came down, and the house on the rock stood firm, you know. And then they sing about the foolish man. The foolish man builds his house upon the sand. He's got a foundation that's not strong, his foundation. And when the rains come down, the floods came up, that house on the sand fell flat. That's exactly what it is. If we don't have this foundation, if we don't have the foundation of the six things that we're going to talk about here in the rest of our lessons. If we don't have those foundations, repentance from dead works and faith towards God and the doctrine of baptisms, all of those things, we don't have anything. We don't have a foundation. And if all of that that we do have is not built upon the fact that in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, that in Jesus Christ, that he is the mediator between God and man, the doctrine of Christ, that he abideth in, in that that hath the Father and the Son. With that revelation, everything falls in place and builds and we become part of the body of Christ and grow and grow in Him. But we've got to make sure I, I, I ask you to, to consider this. I ask you to really pray about this and study about this, that you would get this revelation because when He says that, He builds His house upon the rock. 1 Corinthians 10 and 4 talks about the rock that followed Israel through the wilderness and says, and that rock was Christ, is Christ. It is Christ. It's that doctrine of who Jesus Christ is. He is God the Father revealed to mankind. That's who Jesus is. And so I mean, thank you guys for joining us. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being here, guys. And, and uh, I pray that the word of God is, is spoke to your heart. I encourage you. I encourage you. The quiz is going to come out. I'm going to get the quiz out. And answer the questions in the quiz. And like I say, I'm going to try to have one little bit tricky one. And uh, there's only 500 questions in the quiz, so it shouldn't take you that long. To <laughs> no. <laughs> there is going to be something fairly simple and straightforward, but I encourage you to take it and uh, follow us along. Stay with us for the class. And, and each week it's going to be available. And we're going to continue on, and we're going to get this foundation built. So amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah.